Robin Radar Systems provide you with a complete overview of bird and drone activity on and around your aerodrome. Our bird radars provide you with the actionable information you need to take control of your bird hazard issue. With both tactical and strategic data on offer, you'll be able to mitigate and prevent high-risk bird activity more accurately and with less effort than before. Increase safety while reducing bird strike incidents and expensive claims. Our drone detection systems enable you to take early control of drone hazards as they develop. Coordinate drone incidents with confidence and share clear and accurate threat location information with law enforcement agencies and other stakeholders. Reduce costly disruption and delays while increasing safety and security. Subscription-based pricing options available. Get in touch with us to find out more. Rising air traffic volumes over the last decades puts increasing demands on reliable aeronautical information availability, which is often inaccurate, outdated, inconsistent, faulty or hard to read, and so undermining the safety of civil aviation. NG Aviation supports the industry by the digitization of various aeronautical information significantly increasing safety, improving data quality, and enhancing situational awareness. Its digital platform transforms previously scattered aeronautical information into a single comprehensive data source shared among all aviation stakeholders. NG Aviation gives all involved parties the possibility to speak the common language. Our platform significantly improves communication, information and data exchange. So, for example, if a taxiway must be closed, all involved parties are notified via digital interface. Digital communication allows for clear, more effective and safer airport operations. Digital data improves communication and navigation through complex airspaces. In case of closure due to military exercise or unexpected circumstances, stakeholders are notified in order to avoid any hazardous situation. The unexpected closure of a runway during the approach is not a problem anymore. Our platform shares the information immediately in a clear and visually understandable way. NG Aviation builds safer and more effective digital aviation of the future. Join the revolution now. powerful solution to the FOD problem, AFOD, is an electro-optical detection system supported with artificial intelligence, which is built to prevent the damage to airplanes and airports caused by foreign objects. Thoroughly inspecting airport runways, AFOD provides a constant flow of images and information to a central unit located at the control tower to be further processed by advanced AFOD algorithms. AFOD serves four main functions. 
By continuously inspecting airport runways, it detects FOD specifying their location, size, number, and type of material. It also identifies wildlife presence, providing information as detailed as the species of the animal detected. It detects cracks and accumulation areas. It measures the depth of snow and thickness of ice. At Moog, we understand how costly foreign object debris can be, which is why we offer the Tarsier Automatic Runway FOD Detection System. In the 11 years since Tarsier was created, it has helped ensure 6 million plus FOD free operations. It's the United States military's system of choice for FOD detection, and it can function in any and all weather conditions. The difference between Tarsier and manual FOD inspections is easy to see. Tarsier has proven that it detects all the FOD all the time, while manual inspections may miss items due to lighting conditions or the speed of a vehicle inspection. For over 65 years, Moog has been servicing the aircraft industry with innovative products and solutions. With the Tarsier Runway FOD detection system, we're providing a solution that can generate revenue for your airport, prevent costly airport damage and lawsuits, and improve safety. Contact us. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session on birds and habitat management from the Aviation Events Group. Uh, we have two speakers for you this afternoon. Um, my name is Ian Witter, 35-year uh, airside operations career uh, based at uh, Heathrow until recently. Um, the two speakers we have are Kathy Boyles uh, from DFW and Dan Parsons uh, from Kaza in Australia, where I might point out it's 1.30 in the morning. So well done for Dan for that. Um, so uh, on with the conference. So we have uh, the ability to ask questions in the uh, stage chat on the right hand side. Please make use of that and we'll try and deal with questions that come up. And you can also communicate in private or public groups of up to six using the front row networking tool also on the bottom right hand side of your screens. So first up, uh, I'll introduce uh, Kathy Boyles. Uh, Kathy is a uh, Federal Aviation Administration qualified airport wildlife biologist and has been at DFW Airport, their wildlife administrator, since 2006. She collaborates with airfield operations personnel, numerous support departments and various outside professionals to manage the airport's comprehensive wildlife hazard mitigation program. She currently serves on the Bird Strike Committee USA, representing the airport sector and continues an active role in that Bird Strike Committee Communications Subcommittee, where she served as the chair for five years. So Kathy's going to do a talk on effective habitat management. Over to you, Kathy. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you, and thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, without further ado, we'll just get started. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay. Fantastic. Awesome. Okay. Uh, as Ian mentioned, I am the wildlife administrator at Dallas Fort Worth International Airport, and I will do my very, very best to remember that we have an international audience here and we're not all just from Texas. So here we go. Um, so habitat management. Um, first of all, let's talk a little bit about what habitat is. Um, we'll define it give some examples and then talk about habitat at airports and then how we can manipulate, mitigate, 
manage it for aviation safety. And here in uh, the states uh, for part 139 airports, it is a requirement that we implement um, wildlife hazard mitigation for aviation safety. All right, so what is habitat? If my mouse will, there we go. My mouse is still sleeping and it's got no 1 a.m. excuse. Um, so habitat, I just pulled up some definitions. Um, habitat is the place or environment where a plant or animal naturally or normally lives and grows. And that's from Miriam Webster's dictionary. Um, a habitat uh, meets all the environmental conditions an organism needs to survive. For an animal, that means everything it needs to find and gather food, select a mate and successfully reproduce. Um, a habitat doesn't always apply to animals, though. It does also apply to plants, and that's important to know because um, as my uh, talk will um, include, it's uh, we're talking from the ground up. We've got to get to the very basis of, of um, why a species or a potentially hazardous um, organism or population might be uh, thriving in an, in a, an environment. So we want to find out why it's there and plants are very much a part of that. So um, it is also where the species will attempt to be as adaptive as possible. Uh, we all know that there are su such plants as um, conifers. There's also such plants as cactus or cacti, and they have different adaptations that allow them to um, be more successful in their environment than others are. So these types of things are super important when we're looking at how best to manage or mitigate uh, hazards or manage or manipulate an environment. Okay, so typically when we're thinking of habitats, we're thinking of natural habitats, places where penguins might live, where cacti might uh, adapt, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we think of meadows and we think of forests and sometimes we think of marine type situations. Um, again, typically we think of these as naturally occurring, but that's not necessarily always the case. Um, human beings do occupy this planet, so we do have urban areas and airports are part of that. Man-made habitats and the structures, that's important, in them also support, support and um provide for the adaptations that um, populations and organisms use, both plant and animal. At airports, we have our urban settings. Uh, these are the most common for airports, of course. We have our, uh, our pavements. We have our um, landscaped areas where the customers come and go. We have structures that support bridges, et cetera. We also have our wide open uh, runway, taxiway, ramp areas. Um, these areas do provide for animals that have learned to either adapt to or even rely on the habitats that we provide for them. We also might think of, and I, I like to say that we don't need to, to maybe think of, but it's important to think of the other habitats outside the airfield or the AOA the environment where aircraft are, are moving around, and that's outside of that environment. We've got tenants that occupy those areas um, that are also urban settings, and they can have food trucks, they can have um, trash bins, they can have cargo coming and going, and these do provide for a habitat, uh, part of a habitat, um, the shelter or the food or the water that animals need to survive. Um, that photo on the upper right is a tenant that was using water for landscaping or for turf management or something. And uh, leaky water is uh, can be an issue. So um, airports do have habitat outside of the natural that we typically think of. And those are things that we have to think about. We know about the grasslands. We know about the uh, erosion control that is required or needed at necessary at airports. Um, and typically these are vegetative in nature. Um, some airports do have artificial turf or pavements, et cetera. Um, all of these though will provide for something that an organism or an animal needs in order to um, occupy a space. Um, we need to remember also that these 
sometimes innocuous looking things, these things that just don't seem to be very big of a deal, they can be because they might support smaller organisms that attract um, larger predatory organisms or um, uh, even smaller, smaller organisms that attract the larger predatory uh, organisms. And I focus a lot on birds here. That's uh, a, an issue here in the States. Issues around the world might be four-legged creatures, um, mammals, or even reptiles, depending on where you're at. So that's an important thing to think of, too. I do focus on birds. Here in the States, 99 point something percent of, uh, or it might be 97 point uh, percent of uh, bird strikes or wildlife strikes involve birds. So that's typically something we focus on here. And again, I'm trying very hard not to just look at um, what I know and what I experience, but um, think outside of that um, avian um, uh, population. Requirements at airports are structures. Uh, we've got to have the nav aids, et cetera, and some signs, things like that. So these are also typically used for animals, maybe not so much for shelter or maybe not so much ne necessarily, excuse me, not at all for food or water, but these are structures that animals might need to perch to get up high, to, to um, get away from predators to see prey, to find prey, et cetera. Or even in the uh, upper left-hand photo, you're looking at a uh, photo of a bird that grabbed something down below and flew up high, hoping to get away from everybody and eat it. Unfortunately, something came and saw what they were doing and <laughs> joined them. But um, these structures are also used by animals for perches and for elevated uh, hunting spots. Uh, detention and retention. Airports do have uh, water that they need to either control or retain. So these can also be areas that animals either go to for the actual water or go to because of the insects that uh, are that use the water. So um, those are areas too that provide habitat. Uh, landscaping. I, I touched on this earlier. Landscaping necessarily um, for beauty for our customers when they come to our airports, but we need to be careful about what we're providing. Um, they inadvertently sometimes pr uh, provide for shelter, they provide uh, food and uh, flocks of birds, typically smaller here, but, um, and that's probably a good generalization is that the smaller birds, but sometimes flocking birds will uh, come to those. And it's important to remember too, I did want to remember or mention this and, and talk about this today is that even though we think of these landscape areas as being well away from the aircraft movement areas, birds fly and they travel and they go over those movement areas to access those seemingly benign areas that, that have no aviation safety relation. However, birds will fly over those areas to get to their food or their shelter. So it's important to remember uh, wildlife movement as well. Okay, so what are we gonna do about it? I have a number of rules that I try to uh, use in my work life. Um, and number one rule I think is to plan smart, plan ahead and plan early, plan before it's too late to try to prevent or mitigate the, the hazardous situation. Um, and also know that what you're planning might have a consequence and think of a backup plan. So look at plan A, look at plan B, and don't forget there are many more letters in the alphabet. So if A or B doesn't work, find another plan. Know your, what I call it, opponents, and it's not necessarily, that sounds kind of negative, but um, know what you're up against. Um, know that nature will fill a vacuum. Nature abhors a vacuum is one of the rules of nature. Um, and if a space is vacated by anything, by anything, tearing it up, uh, burning, whatever it is, something is going to come in and free up that space. So thinking ahead, planning ahead, and knowing this will allow you to select um, the proper plan for what's going to go in that space. 
And remember this, that habitat management or manipulation is never habitat obli obliteration. Um, animals will find a space. They're going to come out and look. They're going to come out and check it out. So it's important uh, that we all remember this, um, this rule. Okay. Know your hazards. Then pick your battles. It's not only... Um, what is the most frequently seen or the most um, popular or the most uh, known um, species that might be the most hazardous? Which battle are you going to take on here? Are, you, are we going to take on the smallest flocking birds or are we going to take on that big one that has the biggest, the most uh, density and mass um, as a hazard that might need to be mitigated? Unless you're very much like, unlike uh, most of us, we don't have unlimited resources or funds, so sometimes we have to pick our battles. Um, sometimes we have to select where we're going to prioritize our resources, our personnel, our money, et cetera. Um, know where your priorities are, then pick your battles. Uh, know your tools. Train to use them. Recruit the pros. Be creative. Um, training in advance and being prepared for um, what needs to be done to manipulate or prevent a habitat is super important. Recruiting professionals is very important because one person can't do everything. It's impossible. Communicating with others and bringing them into the mix and, and asking their input and their guidance uh, can be very important. Um, bringing in um, outside professionals that might not even have anything to do with aviation for their expertise can be very important in mitigating or preventing hazards. In this case, on the bottom right-hand corner, we have two professionals from kind of the same background, but who have different um, specialties <clears throat> consulting about um, how best to mitigate some uh, weedy vegetation um, that we had at our airport that was attracting wildlife. So these two professionals bringing them in and asking their opinions on um, what to do about what was identified was very important to mitigating some hazards that we had at our airport. And last, being creative. Um, we don't sometimes think about um, the immediate uh, response to a situation, the immediate, uh, you know, if you have a population of birds and, and you, you, we know noise scares them away, we know fake owls might scare them away or predators might scare them away. Um, that's sometimes very short-lived um, deterrence and dispersal methods. So thinking outside of the box and, and being creative to look at other options uh, can be very important. In this case, we brought in a falconer to disperse some roosting nighttime blackbirds. And this proved to be more effective than the, uh, the clappers we had used, the flashing lights that we'd used, the uh, air, air, compressed air and, and water and things like that. Those are such short term. Those birds know when we leave. Um, this falconer was able to address a hazardous situation that we could not uh, and did it much quicker. So um, think outside the box. Okay, um, so speaking about habitat manipulation, then what's an airport to do? So prevent first and mitigate. Um, how can you prevent um, access or um, activity on grasslands where most of us will have grasslands. Well, first of all, prevent the access. Put in some good fences. Um, uh, most strips work very well, which are concrete footings underneath the fence. That works fantastic. Um, many animals, this is what they do. They find ways around um, what we try to fix. That's their job. That's how they survive and thrive, is to find ways to survive. So um, digging underneath the fence is very easy for a coyote and they'll do it. Um, putting grates in front of uh, culverts where a drain might run from the airfield to off the airfield and putting a grate there so that mammals can't use that grate as a, um, a, a access point um, can help. 
but birds uh, don't have, uh, they, fences don't work on birds. There's not a fence that's tall enough to prevent a bird from coming onto an airfield. So um, thinking outside the box is really, really important. Um, on the right top picture there, you see a picture of a mower going over some grass, but behind it where that arrow is pointing is uh, some vegetation that managed to keep its head down lower than the uh, mower's blades. Mowing isn't always the best solution. Um, bottom left there, you see where some um, uh, windrows, I guess you call them, uh, grass that got too long because we couldn't access that uh, portion of the, the turf. Um, Due to environmental conditions, we couldn't get out there. So now the grass got so long, and as the mowers um, went over it, it just created those windrows. And I know Trilo Cut and Collect would have a solution for this. Um, if it happened often enough, perhaps we would take advantage of it, but um, uh, not always. So um, what this does is these little windrows um, are collection points, and they can provide habitat for insects. Um, they can also um, allow seeds that might have grown on that vegetation to lay low, to lay fallow, and then provide enough moisture for those seeds to germinate and grow. And now you've got not only seeds that are, are laying there, but also future vegetation that might be unwanted. The other thing about mowing is that sometimes mowing itself, the very action of mowing can attract birds. They know that um, basically what we could be doing is laying out the banquet for them. Um, flushing up the insects, uh, laying out the seeds that uh, maybe a bird couldn't reach because it was the, at the top of a eight or 12 inch uh, grass stalk or some other kind of um, uh, stalk. So birds figure this out and, and sometimes it's, a very, it's an attractant to them. So thinking outside the box to see what kind of solution there might be rather than mowing can be very important as well. Again, we have our two professionals um, consulting with one another, looking to see what results were of the spraying that you see on the right-hand side. The spraying was a um, concerted, very uh, coordinated effort between these two professionals to not only know what we had growing on our airfield, um, it's very important to know what your, your hazards are. So bringing in these professionals to identify those hazards and then the other professional to say, okay, this is what we've got. Here's how we're going to mitigate it or manage it or eliminate it um, effectively without messing with the, the good grass, the good turf that we wanted to grow that works well in our area. So bringing in the professionals to do this is a very good solution. For many, many airports, mowing is easy. We know how to get on a mower. We know how to turn it on and drive it around, et cetera. But sometimes that's not the best solution. And sometimes it's just beating your head against the wall. So uh, learning from um, the past, learning from others, I think is very important um, and implementing it if you can. All right, we've got these structures that are required on our airports. So um, what do we do about those? Well. We can do uh, mitigation. We can put it, put up preventives, uh, deterrence, things like that. Uh, we've got wires, spikes. Uh, there's a sticky gel that sometimes has a component in it that birds don't care for because it's a little bit hot. I think they call it hot foot gel. You can put up netting on some certain open areas, et cetera. Those are things that are very um, effective. They can be. However, if they're not done correctly, they are not effective. Birds, other animals, wildlife will find the chink in our armor every single time. So we need to make sure that what we're doing is done thoroughly and well and implemented it uh, in that way. <clears throat> Planning ahead is very important when we're landscaping, when we're building things. Again, that netting that I talked about, when we're landscaping, put up uh, or build a, a plan for plants in our landscapes that will not attract wildlife, that will not produce berries, fruit, seeds. These things look wonderful during certain seasons. However, they are attractants. So trying to find leafy uh, attractives, uh, attractants uh, for us, for people, is, is very important so that we're not attracting birds. Again, birds and 
other wildlife that might cross our airfields to get to it. Landscape planning is super, super important. Limiting turf grasses to, to perennials, which are um, uh, plants that, that die back but don't die and come back every year. Um, suited for your airport's region is very important as well. And I say perennials because you're not planting a seed every year. You're not relying on seeds that can uh, attract wildlife. Proactive planning uh, is very important. Um, in the right-hand uh, side up there on the top, you see a rounded structure. Uh, for some reason, birds don't like rounded structures. It's not hard to, to um, balance on, I guess. So that helps out a lot. Putting out signs and things is super important as well. On the bottom there, you can see where um, there was a, a beautiful pond, but the way that the pond was built makes it very difficult for wading birds to get into. So that's smart planning, very smart planning. Controlling your water is super important. It means following your regulations or guidelines um, by being neighborly, uh, not just dumping water downstream for the, for the neighbor to deal with, but detaining it long enough so that we're letting that water flow off of our um, airports in a uh, neighborly way, um, responsibly. Uh, when we have to retain waters, there are grids that can be put up to deter birds from using that pond. Um, our wildlife mitigation programs, whatever hazardous programs we have or documents that we have should include language requiring our tenants, our leaseholders, ourselves to uh, control and drain water. And I, I say ourselves because again, we're going back to the budget situations where we have uh, conflict, conflicting needs for budgets and available funds. So if we have something written into our documents that says we have to do this, it makes it much easier for us to implement what we know needs to be done. All right, uh, airport habitats in general, uh, know your tools and train to use them. This is actually a pond situation that was next to a construction area that uh, we happened to pass by and there was this water that hadn't been there before this little road in the foreground was built. So what we did is brought in our handy dandy part 107 uh, certified person um, who um, knew how, who was trained and ready to use a piece of equipment that allowed us to see what was going on. We were on the ground level looking at a part of a situation bringing up a tool to see the full situation was super, super helpful. So now we can see what the full extent of a problem or an issue is or was, we've since mitigated it, um, and what we can do about it. So then we could go back to the person responsible or the folks responsible and say, hey, we've got this habitat here that wasn't there before. And it's, as you can see, attracting birds. It's that little white guy down there. There were the others that you saw in that picture. So that's a habitat that is not uh, permitted at our airport. And if you have certain situations or similar situations, um, having the tools to fully identify what the what the challenge is, what the expanse of the issue is, is super important. So uh, know your tools and train to use them. Um, getting to the end here, uh, it's very, very important to collect and share data. Collecting data, tracking progress is super important because it allows two things. It's pre preparing, uh, if not only tracking progress, but being prepared to justify whether or not where we're going is the right direction or changing course. Maybe that's not the right direction. Maybe it's not working like we thought it would. So now we got to think of a different plan, but we don't know that without documenting it, without collecting data, consistently collecting good data. And I highly encourage uh, for any habitat or any other kind of uh, management program to take photos. You can explain for hours what something looks like, but if you show a picture, there's a, a reason for that, uh, that quote or that uh, verse, a picture paints a thousand words because it's true. In this photo, we've got uh, an area of our airfield that was um, treated with that, uh, our, man, our new management, our herbicide management program that used uh, pre-emergence as well as broadleaf weed mitigation. Um, the foreground was treated, the background there behind the fence where the red arrow is showing 
um, was not treated. Now it looks much better. It looks awesome. It's green. It's lush. It's wonderful. But that is insect and seed producing habitat. Um, that is an early springtime weed. In the foreground, we still have grass that is still dormant. Uh, early springtime again, our grass doesn't come into uh, uh, its season until uh, say May, June, July. Um, so we know that what we were doing is working. Our weeds were not um, thriving because we got them. So it's a really good thing. But anyway, this picture, show this picture. Okay, we get it. All right. Last but not least, uh, just a list of some things to know is ask lots of questions with whoever you're working with or we are working with. It's important to ask a lot of questions. What's it doing? What's going on here? Um, think outside the box. Use all the information that you have to think outside the box for different solutions. As I mentioned, let's not beat our head, heads against the wall over the same thing, but maybe Use your use outside resources to help you think of uh, different ways to mitigate a situation. Professionals, wildlife groups, we have Audubon Society here in our area. There might be other societies in your area that um, know the bird situations, know the populations, the four-legged creatures, etc. Area university students, man, they are curious and they're smart. Use them if you can. They've got professors too that will guide them. Also know your regulators and your regulations. When we are dealing with habitat, we're dealing with not only our local, but our state and our federal regulators. We're also looking at the FAA with Federal Aviation Administration at um, environmental protection agencies, both at the regional and the federal level. And those need to be considered when we're considering uh, habitat manipulation or uh, hazard mitigation. That's all I have. And I've included my email address here. If anybody has any questions, if I've um, gone through something too quickly or didn't explain it, please um, feel free to reach out to me. All right, I see a question here from Andy. What do you recommend for proper turf or lawn maintenance, fertilization, herbicide, all of the above if necessary. And the height is uh, dependent upon what your hazards are at your airport. Some bird species prefer a taller height because they can hide in it. Others prefer a shorter height because they can see. So it depends on what your hazards are. As I mentioned, first and foremost, know your hazards and select what the most hazardous one is that you're going to address. One of the other parts too is not just the bird thing, but we've got the coyotes that, man, our birds might uh, prefer a, uh, a taller grass or a shorter grass, excuse me, we start growing taller grass, then we've got hidey places for coyotes. So that's not a good thing either. So do we have any other questions? Oh, and proper turf for lawn maintenance, fertilization, herbicide, maybe all of the above. Um, get rid of what's crowding out the species that um, you want to have, get rid of that first because it might be out competing the good stuff um, and then give the fertilizer to encourage and help the good stuff. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I think that, those are the questions. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Very informative. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, so if we move on to our, our next speaker, uh, Dan Parsons. Uh, Dan is an aviation safety professional with 15 years experience in airport and the wider aviation industry. He's a PhD candidate with Central Queensland University researching wildlife hazard management, reporting and risk assessment. And Dan's passion is sharing aerodrome safety tools and techniques and lessons learned on his blog, therunwaycenterline.com. Uh, Dan's talk is entitled, Expanding Safety Performance Indicators for Wildlife Hazard Management. Dan, over to you. Thank you very much, Ian. And thank you everybody for uh, attending uh, this afternoon or this morning, uh, if you are in that part of the world. Um, the talk I'm bringing today is something that I pulled together more from a general in sort of investigation into safety performance indicators for my personal website. Uh, by day, I work in aerodrome safety standards for a regulator. Uh, and then for some reason at night, I still like to talk about airport operations and safety. I'm a bit of a nerd in that way. 
And so I like to uh, write about the things that affect airport ops and safety on my personal website. And in this particular case, I was intrigued by sort of where we're, sta where we're sitting with respect to safety performance indicators. And I think probably some of the barriers to fully implementing a broad approach to safety performance management, uh, especially with wildlife hazard management, but also with other aspects of aviation safety on our airports. If you're interested in, uh, excuse me, if you're interested in uh, safety performance management, then you are definitely in the area of safety management systems. And the best resource, I think, to get into safety management systems generally is the safety management manual produced by ICAO. And if you jump into that particular document and start looking at safety performance management, you come across essentially a, a discussion, an open discussion about various options you have with respect to safety performance indicators. And most of this discussion tends to lean a particular way. So in the initial stages, it's often a discussion around qualitative versus quantitative indicators qualitative being your much more subjective, descriptive approach to describing safety, and the quantitative approach being more objective and counting certain activities or outcomes. The discussion then typically moves into a discussion on numbers versus rates. Uh, rates are tended uh, to be considered advantageous, uh, sorry, advantageous because of the ability to compare uh, say different years, different time periods, or different operators on the same basis. So a rate being a number of something happening divided by some sort of activity level, whether that's movements typically for airports or hours flown for maintenance or sectors flown for airlines generally. Probably the most interesting discussion in the safety management manual is around these potentially competing concepts of lagging indicators versus leading indicators. Lagging indicators are the ones we're most familiar with. These are essentially accident statistics, bird strike statistics, the things that measure what has happened. And that's essentially the weakness that this discussion is trying to get past. The lagging indicator is uh, counting the past and our ability to intervene in those particular events has been lost. A leading indicator, on the other hand, is some sort of uh, measurement of what could happen in the future. So there still exists this possibility that we might intervene and avert disaster. But I think there's some problems with the discussion associated, especially with lagging versus leading indicators. The first one being, I think it's a bit of a false dichotomy. And by that, I mean, it's not either or. If one tries to separate uh, and or to place a particular indicator into either the lagging bucket or the leading bucket, uh, I often I think there's a intellectual discussion uh, avoided with respect to the time that this particular indicator flips from being lagging or leading. Is a bird strike, for example, a leading indicator to a disaster, much like the miracle on the Hudson? or is a bird strike itself lagging? And these discussions, I don't think, really help the overall objective of safety performance management. When discussing leading indicators, a lot of the literature will focus on what they call process indicators, so a measurement of a particular activity. And there's two particular concerns I have with focusing on activities as an indicator of safety performance. The first one is a lot of airport-based activities, uh, tasks that we undertake as, at an airport are actually compliance-driven. So inspecting runways, uh, monitoring wildlife are often compliance activities that are established through an aerodrome manual or some other procedure. And 100% is essentially the minimum and maximum objective. So if you ever have a safety performance indicator where it's always reported at 100%, then it's not a very useful indicator because there's no decision to be made at any point in the future. Another problem with process-driven indicators, as far as I can tell, is essentially a gaming of the system. One of the very specific 
indicators mentioned in the safety management manual related to wildlife hazard management is the conducting of harassment activities. But in the first instance, I can't tell whether more is good or more is bad. And it'll be very much context driven about whether you're a perhaps habitat management type aerodrome where that's the bulk of the wildlife hazard management activity there, increases in harassment activities might be a bad thing. Whereas if you can't achieve much with habitat management, harassment might be your primary activity and therefore more might be better. However, in either case, our personnel, try as they might, may be incentivized to game that system and either conduct more harassment activities when not potentially required or avoid harassment activities if there is some incentive to managing what the safety performance outcome will be. To try and get my head around what might be a good uh, excuse me, field associated with safety performance indicators in this space, I looked for an analogy and looking around for other industries that have indicators of performance, I landed on health, which is a pretty good uh, analogy for safety. They're often sister disciplines, especially in the workplace or occupational uh, setting. And in health, we tend to see this wide range of indicators for individual or societal health. We have at the extreme, essentially the same lagging indicator on the right for health as in safety. So death being the ultimate indicator, I guess, of poor health and poor safety. But also at the other end on the left-hand side, we have very well-established and understood process-driven indicators in terms of diet and exercise. They're not perfect indicators of health. They're still maybe other underlying issues, but generally speaking, if one has a good diet and engages in plenty of exercise, they can be considered healthy. Where health overall really shines is this vast range of other indicators of varying levels of detail and certainty that one can engage on. Something simple as taking a temperature of yourself is an indicator of your health, or at least potentially a poor health situation. We have a whole range of diagnostic tools based on samples of fluids and tissue from our body. We can identify proteins and other contaminants in our system that could be indicators of health issues. We have a whole range of uh, monitoring systems looking at our body's functions that again can give us further indications. And then we have what might be considered lagging in some respects, but also other health indications, perhaps surgery associated with poor circulation or other major uh, health issues that are still precursors to, unfortunate, the ultimate uh, lagging indicator on the right. So when we try and bring this back to wildlife hazard management, what sort of indicators do we already have and where can we place them on this continuum? On the far right, we have catastrophic events like the Miracle on the Hudson or the Ural Airlines event uh, some 10 years later. Luckily, we don't have the sort of full fatality catastrophes uh, in our recent history, but we have definitely lost planes and all lives on board in the past due to bird strikes. Uh, we obviously have bird strikes, which most would consider a lagging indicator, but still might give us some potential for examination of our problems and intervention in the future. And we have those process-driven uh, indicators as well, either harassment activities or other active measures on an aerodrome or perhaps things like habitat management on our airport as well. But what is in the middle is still a bit of an open question for me. Again, I went out looking for a bit of a model to try and fill the gap here. And the SMM, again, gave us a little bit of an indication that we should always look for indicators related to our objectives. Now, most airports will describe their objectives in very high level terms. And in wildlife hazard management, they'll typically fall into something like minimizing wildlife strikes or perhaps minimizing damaging wildlife strikes, but that's not very actionable for our frontline staff or perhaps even wildlife managers themselves. So again, looking for an analogy or a model to fit in, 
I settled in on the military, which is great for cascading their objectives from the very high level strategic outlook of the general staff, for example, through to campaigns and operations down into the very tactical, simple level of uh, direction that they can give their frontline fighters. If we take, for example, a very old World War II concept, then uh, perhaps the Allied forces would describe their strategic objective as reaching Berlin and ending the war. They would then have to operationalize that through a number of campaigns, such as D-Day landings, Operation Market Garden, and so on, as they pursue that strategic objective. But for the guys on the ground, that's going to be drilled down even further to things as simple as take that hill, destroy that gun emplacement, and very actionable outcomes that can be measured in that environment. And again, bringing that back to wildlife hazard management, we can do the same thing. We can have the strategic objective of simply minimizing strikes. Then through our wildlife hazard management plan, we will operationalize that in a number of areas. One is most likely going to be around habitat management and what sort of habitats you have or would like and how do you manage that? And then you have to turn that into something very measurable and tactical for your actual team on the ground. So in that habitat management, grassland management space, that might be as specific as describing a maximum grass height length, which is something we've already talked about uh, today. And then we turn that essentially into our safety performance indicator. Coming back to our continuum at all, it might seem a little crazy, but uh, it's something I actually have done, and that is measured grass height. Take a sample of our grasslands on an airport and measured it to ensure that it met our objective, which was, for our particular airport, a short grass policy. Again, depending on the context, you may have a particular aspect of your wildlife hazard management plan that is limiting breeding at nearby breeding sites at your airport. In this particular case, I wouldn't create an indicator that is something like number of eggs destroyed or things like that. I'd try again to look at the outcomes and counting essentially the uh, fledgling population after a breeding season where you have intervened in some measure, whether that is egg destruction or some chemical treatment. I find it hard to get away from the idea that more birds equals more bird strikes. So I think a systematic approach to bird counting is a great performance indicator. Again, tied to your actual activities, uh, if they are focused at minimizing the number of birds on your airport, if that is something that you can manage. If it's not something you can manage and you have a much more active approach, then there may be a different relationship between these particular indicators. And then the last one here, I've got icebergs, which is not really an indicator, but more a reminder that when we are looking at safety, we often use an iceberg analogy that our lagging indicators, our significant outcomes are often described as just the tip of an iceberg. And the whole picture of the safety problem we're looking at is often hidden below the surface. And we have to go looking for it. We have to go looking for near miss events, or other hazards that have been reported that aren't being managed yet. There's one more category of uh, issues, I think, related to safety performance, and that is what I call the law of unintended consequences, or is a well-known law. But in this particular case, I think we're finally getting to a point in our industry where reporting culture has increased significantly. And now some of our interventions actually have the real possibility of reducing our wildlife strike rate in a measurable way. For example, some great work coming out of Germany by Isabel Metz looking at air traffic control alerting systems do have the potential to avoid wildlife strikes and to see those numbers go down, which might give us great cause for celebration and then we might take our foot off the gas, so to speak. However, that could have the unintended consequence of an over-reliance on that type of activity, which could increase aircraft holding, fuel costs, and delays to the industry overall. So we have to keep managing all these aspects and not necessarily relying on one particular indicator overall. 
So I think there's definitely room to expand our overall universe, if you will, of safety performance indicators, start treating our indicators as a continuum from, we shouldn't ignore some of the process driven indicators right through to our historical lagging indicators. And in that space, we should be looking to essentially connect the dots through our entire wildlife hazard management plan. Uh, thank you very much for everybody for your attention. And uh, if any questions pop up, more than happy to uh, jump in and answer them. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, very uh, thought provoking. I, I think one question that's come up is um, the, 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 the modernization of some tools. So, you know, you've talked about objectives and, you know, you need to be able to measure something. And, and if you need to, if you want to, you know, what, what gets measured gets managed. How does bird radar play into that space? You know, that's a relatively new tool in the over the last you know twenty five years or whatever. The the accuracy and success of bird radar. Do you do you see that as uh, how do you see that playing into this sort of uh, topic? Uh, I think it's uh, I think it'll become almost an essential tool in the future. The the level of data that you could get from those that you can get from those systems. Uh, I mentioned the air traffic control alerting mm -hmm. approach that's being uh, further developed and hopefully popularized somewhat. That's essentially reliable, reliant on a radar system to, to give that data mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the air traffic control tower. Um, but further than that, I think it really helps to give you some of that objective data mm -hmm. with respect to not only bird numbers, but bird tracks. Uh, and I think as Kathy mentioned earlier, when you've got limited funds, you've got to get the biggest bang for your buck. So if you can use that type of data to identify particularly hazardous species that are not only represent the biomass that you need to avoid, but also are in the places planes are at the same time that the planes are there, then you get to maximize the impact for what might be a limited budget that you have Okay. Yeah, no, that's great. No, thank you, Dan. Um, okay. I think we're pretty much uh, on time. So uh, again, I'd just like to thank uh, Kathy and Dan for their uh, presentations. Also the session sponsor, uh, Trilo, and the series sponsors, Robin Radar. Thanks to everyone for tuning in today. Just a reminder, next Wednesday, FOD and safety on the ground and birds, drones, and safety in the air. Next Wednesday, chaired by uh, John Hampshire, with speakers from the Bird Strike Association of Canada, Yuma, London Luton, Argus AI, DFW, and Robin Radar. And that's next Wednesday. Okay, thanks everyone for tuning in. Thanks again, and goodbye. Thanks everyone. Robin Radar Systems provide you with a complete overview of bird and drone activity on and around your aerodrome. Our bird radars provide you with the actionable information you need to take control of your bird hazard issue. With both tactical and strategic data on offer, you'll be able to mitigate and prevent high-risk bird activity more accurately and with less effort than before. Increase safety while reducing bird strike incidents and expensive claims. Our drone detection systems enable you to take early control of drone hazards as they develop. Coordinate drone incidents with confidence and share clear and accurate threat location information with law enforcement agencies and other stakeholders. Reduce costly disruption and delays while increasing safety and security. Subscription-based pricing options available. Get in touch with us to find out more.
the rising air traffic volumes over the last decades puts increasing demands on reliable aeronautical information availability, which is often inaccurate, outdated, inconsistent, faulty or hard to read, and so undermining the safety of civil aviation. NG Aviation supports the industry by the digitization of various aeronautical information, significantly increasing safety, improving data quality and enhancing situational awareness. Its digital platform transforms previously scattered aeronautical information into a single comprehensive data source shared among all aviation stakeholders. NG Aviation gives all involved parties the possibility to speak the common language. Our platform significantly improves communication, information and data exchange. So, for example, if a taxiway must be closed, all involved parties are notified via digital interface. Digital communication allows for clear, more effective and safer airport operations. Digital data improves communication and navigation through complex airspaces. In case of closure due to military exercise or unexpected circumstances, stakeholders are notified in order to avoid any hazardous situation. The unexpected closure of a runway during the approach is not a problem anymore. Our platform shares the information immediately in a clear and visually understandable way. NG Aviation builds safer and more effective digital aviation of the future. Join the revolution now. A powerful solution to the FOD problem, AFOD, is an electro-optical detection system supported with artificial intelligence, which is built to prevent the damage to airplanes and airports caused by foreign objects. Thoroughly inspecting airport runways, AFOD provides a constant flow of images and information to a central unit located at the control tower to be further processed by advanced AFOD algorithms. AFOD serves four main functions. By continuously inspecting airport runways, it detects FOD specifying their location, size, number, and type of material. It also identifies wildlife presence, providing information as detailed as the species of the animal detected. It detects cracks and accumulation areas. It measures the depth of snow and thickness of ice. At Moog, we understand how costly foreign object debris can be, which is why we offer the Tarsier Automatic Runway FOD Detection System. In the 11 years since Tarsier was created, it has helped ensure 6 million plus FOD-free operations. It's the United States military's system of choice for FOD detection, and it can function in any and all weather conditions. The difference between Tarsier and manual FOD inspections is easy to see. Tarsier has proven that it detects all the FOD all the time, while manual inspections may miss items due to lighting conditions or the speed of a vehicle inspection. For over 65 years, Moog has been servicing the aircraft industry with innovative products and solutions. With the Tarsier Runway FOD detection system, we're providing a solution that can generate revenue for your airport, prevent costly airport damage and lawsuits, and improve safety. Contact us.